Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Schönstein. I'm head of strategic foresight at the Policy Lab Digital Work and Society in the German Federal Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. I've been invited um, today to uh, comment a little bit on our efforts to use big data in labor market intelligence. And in order to do that, I would like to proceed in three steps today. First, um, I'll give a very short background on the uh, substantive issues actually occupying us when we look at digitization in the German labor market at present. Secondly, um, I will present um, a couple of pilot projects that use big data to make sense of all of what's going on. And then finally, I'll conclude with a couple of open uh, questions for discussion. So to get started, um, we've often heard um, about the issue of tech upheaval in labor markets. And of course, that is a big issue in Germany as well. It is mainly driven by um, many studies that show increasing automation potential. I have brought two examples that I'm showing here. One is from the Research Institute of the Federal Employment Agency in Germany. The other one is from the OECD. Those are very, very different um, studies using different methodologies. But with those different methodologies, they both look at the same issue, namely how many people work in jobs that are potentially automatable. What they mean is how many jobs um, comprise tasks that can be taken over by machines. And um, what both of those institutions have found is that the share um, of people who work in such jobs has been increasing and it's been increasing relatively fast. The IAB um, has been replicating a study they first conducted in 2013, again, five years later in 2018, and they found an increase of about 15% working in uh, potentially automatable jobs to one in four, 25%. The OECD, um, as I said, using a different methodology, estimated in 2016 that in Germany around about 12.6% um, uh, of the people were working in jobs that would be potentially automatable, um, and that that share has gone up to about 18% um, in 2018. Um, now, of course, um, when we hear news like that, what happens is um, that it shapes very much the public perception of what is going on in the labor market. And this is not happening for the first time. What I've brought you here um, are three covers from a German news magazine called Der Spiegel. The one on your left-hand side dates um, back to 1964, and it shows um, a cover title, Automation in Germany, where a big robot um, kicks a worker off the manufacturing line of a car um, a factory. The second one here in the middle is from 1978, it reads, the computer revolution, progress makes you unemployed. Um, and a large robot is taking a worker um, away from his job. And finally, um, the latest one is from 2016, only a couple of years ago, um, that reads, you're fired. Um, how computers and robots are taking work away and which jobs are safe in the future. The only difference that we see over time is that um, the worker taken away by the robot hand um, first is a blue color worker and then uh, becomes a white color worker. Nevertheless, and this is the public perception um, that we're working uh, with, sometimes against, um, in trying to make sense um, of labor market developments. And those developments um, are very different um, when we look at um, what the expert opinions say. We see um, when we uh, look at uh, classical labor market forecasts, a uh, relatively calm image. Um, the active population and employment uh, increasing slightly, unemployment uh, remaining relatively low and stable far um, into the future. Here we're looking at um, a target year of 2035. Um, until then, um, we don't see that significant change. This, however, uh, was calculated before the corona crisis. Nevertheless, even given the impact of the pandemic, um, we're relatively confident that um, the numbers uh, over the long term are not going to shift dramatically. Nevertheless, the picture we see here is a very different one from the one um, that the press um, is painting. Behind the stability that I've just shown you, however, we see significant structural change. And this structural change um, is quite large. By 2035, you see this on the very right-hand side here, we expect that almost 4 million jobs um, will be lost due to uh, automation, whereas um, we're also going to gain many new jobs. In this case, uh, in this study, um, about 3.25. Um, now, against this backdrop, um, of course, many questions um, are open. Um, how fast is technology really diffusing? Are these forecasts on track? Um, which sectors will be concerned first? This is not a, um, a technology diffusion that will happen uniformly across all sectors of the economy. Which tasks are the most acceptable to be automated really? And what skills do people actually need to work with new technologies? Those are questions um, where our labor market statistics are not made to give us good information on. 
Instead, um, we're turning therefore um, to new data sources, specifically um, to big data sources to try and make sense um, of this. Um, we're working generally um, on different uh, timeframes and given the different timeframes we're looking at, we're also using different methods. A big chunk of our work is actually trying to make sense of the present day. Um, this is where we use um, report statistics, but also try to use um, current big data in real time, if you like. We then work for the medium term, going five to 15 years into the future, um, with quantitative labor market projections. Um, here, um, I will bring you two examples um, of uh, machine learning applications that we use um, to make those a little bit better, we hope. And then finally, for the very long term, uh, we use strategic foresight. Um, this is our instrumental um, or methodological response to the large degree of uncertainty that you have when you look at developments that last 15, 20 or 25 years into the future. Um, for each of those, um, we use uh, different types of um, big data analysis. And I'm going to go through a couple of examples now. The first one really relates to the uh, present time. This is really a, a question of making sense of what's going on around us. We found that classical labor market statistics in Germany lack information about people that are particularly highly qualified and working in sectors that are particularly driven by technology, for example, in IT. However, um, we also know um, that those type of people tend to be very active um, and very present on um, professional social networks such as LinkedIn, which is why um, we've partnered with LinkedIn um, to conduct an analysis of um, skills that people put on their profiles that work in um, uh, high-skilled um, IT professions, and later expanded that to look a bit more closely at um, what type of skills actually go together with the use of certain technologies both in and outside of the IT sector. Here is one um, uh, example uh, from this work um, that will also be uh, uh, published uh, on our website. I've included the link here where you can find more information. What you see here are um, so-called AI skills. Um, I've chosen this example because artificial intelligence is something everybody talks about right now. Um, and really many people say, well, it's really important that we equip our workers with the right skills to design, develop, and diffuse artificial intelligence-driven technologies. Um, but when you ask what skills precisely those are, hardly anybody has an answer. So what we did um, is looking um, into people who work on artificial intelligence and then analyze um, which skills they actually uh, mention on their profiles, cluster them, um, into, the, uh, into a top 10, if you like, and look how that has changed over time. Um, the result is what you see here. These are, as you can see, very, very different um, uh, skills. They change from one year to the other relatively quickly. Some appear in every year, but in a different uh, place in the ranking. Others um, appear uh, new or disappear over time. Um, what we could also analyze are um, related issues. For example, um, how are those skills actually distributed across different sectors? We found, for example, very interesting that the majority of people that have what we call AI skills here, they don't actually work in IT, they work in manufacturing. This is very interesting because it informs us um, sort of about labor market developments that go far beyond individual level um, uh, information. What we could also find um, is that the share of women um, uh, among people with AI skills is tremendously low. That is a very important field of action um, uh, for us and having such information helps to concentrate resources and improve the situation. Of course, we can also use this information to then compare to other countries and um, see uh, maybe where Germany stands in comparison, for example, with the United States or South Korea um, in uh, the, the depth of talent, but also in the distribution of AI skills across different sectors. So what do we really do um, with such type of information? First of all, we monitor the market. For labor ministry, it is important that we know what we're, what we're working with out there um, and have a constant um, reality check and feedback loop from what is happening um, outside. It also informs us about potential training needs. The uh, results that we find from this analysis are made available through counseling um, centers that we have all over the country, for example, to small and medium enterprises that want to invest in artificial intelligence-based technologies and need to hire people. Very often they wonder, well, what kind of skills should I prioritize when I hire people? And this can help um, inform a decision there. But also um, it helps us to monitor the distribution um, and the diffusion um, of AI-based technologies across different sectors. 
Um, this has been a very unexpected side effect of our analysis. But what we really found is because we have this result that uh, we see many people with AI skills in sectors outside IT, um, it allows us to assume better um, where technologies that are based on artificial intelligence are actually used in other sectors. So that has been um, a very uh, uh, interesting project that um, we've piloted and are right now um, uh, scaling uh, into a continuous use. A second example that I'm bringing um, relates to the quantitative forecasting and the more medium term timeframe. Um, here, what we did is that we worked with um, the Research Institute of the Federal Employment Agency that I already mentioned earlier, the IAB, um, in a pilot project to develop a method that uses machine learning to monitor changes um, in the demand for skills from job advertisements. If you like, this project complements the other one that I just presented in that the first one looked at the workers and the skills that they presented as having, so the supply of labor. Whereas here in this project, we're looking at the demand for labor, um, analyzing vacancy notices. Um, we um, trained a uh, machine learning model, um, first of all, in order to understand which parts of a job advertisement actually relate to skills, as opposed to, for example, a description of the company. Um, and then um, uh, trained um, a model to um, analyze these skills um, into which are emerging and then clustering them into a dictionary of new skills that are appearing relative um, to a job title. So for example, um, uh, looking at IT engineers, this is the example I've brought here. Um, we could look um, at an individual competence, in this case, design patterns, um, uh, and see uh, how often, how frequently is it actually mentioned. Um, uh, in this case, um, we looked at the frequency of mentions in April and May and compared it with the um, mentions in October and November um, of 2019. Um, on the right hand side here, you see the difference. And so we could map very quickly in which regions is this particular skill um, increasing in demand um, within a given uh, profession. Um, again, what do we use this for? Um, we can, of course, improve the market monitoring that I already mentioned by combining uh, information from the demand side in the labor market um, with information from the supply side and the labor market that we also have. Um, but what we can also do, um, having both supply and demand information, of course, is improve our forecasting um, of emerging potential shortages of skills. And we can do that by job and region. Um, in general, um, what we do when we project um, uh, potential shortages um, at the skill level is that um, we look uh, on the one hand at the growth rate of competence demand, on the other hand of the, uh, for the competence uh, level of the active population. And we um, uh, try to see and identify the, the search duration um, for companies to find a new talent so that they can actually fill a vacancy and then project that into the future. And what we see here, I've, I've brought here again, same example, um, um, uh, uh, concrete use of the type of data that we've um, analyzed um, in our um, forecasting. Again, the link um, uh, is available here on the slide, so um, you can have a look in your own time uh, into more details um, of our forecasting work. But basically, what, what my point is here is I wanted to show you what we concretely do with this. We can see that um, the average search duration for um, the those skills that are uh, marked with blue dots is sinking. So here we are not expecting um, uh, shortages. Um, they relate to expected ones, such as uh, physical uh, strength or routine work. These are the ones you would initially suspect to be um, replaced by um, uh, machines. But they also relate to teamwork, which is, for example, something that we don't find very automatable, but it seems to be something that is very rapidly spread as a competence among the population. At the same time, um, other types of skills, for example, teaching, um, uh, seem to be uh, continuously scarce. Uh, going forward. So that's the type of information that we derive uh, from big data analysis for our uh, forecasting work for the medium term. And then um, as a last example, um, I also want to look at how we use um, big data um, in our work on the long-term um, strategic foresight exercises that we're conducting. That is um, very uh, particular use because um, in a way, um, Big data is only a very small stepping stone in the very beginning um, of our foresight exercises. Nevertheless, I've chosen to bring this along because I think it highlights the, um, uh, how broad the spectrum of uses um, for big data analysis and labor market intelligence can be. What, we've, um, what we're doing is um, we've set up a, um, a human-machine collaboration 
if you like, um, where um, uh, an application of machine uh, learning uh, is used in the form of research bots. The way it works is that we define um, a search field that is of relevance um, for our work on um, sense making for strategic futures. Um, for example, artificial intelligence or quantum computing. Based on a handful of chosen um, uh, publications, um, search bots derive um, a list of um, uh, informations that they are looking for um, systematically through a wide range of sources and um, bring to us um, reports with uh, signals that they find for emerging trends in those publications. Those reports are then scored for relevance and fed back to the bots so that they improve their uh, performance over time. And in the end, um, what we get is um, a uh, report that's compiled by bots and then edited by humans um, uh, as a kind of background reader on an emerging trend, for example, in artificial intelligence. Um, the added value that we see here is that we can go through a much larger amount of data than any human could. Um, our bots um, analyze 250 million um, scientific publications, uh, around about 50,000 journals and 75,000 news publications. Um, in a matter of hours. Um, that is not something uh, we could be doing with humans alone. So in this case, um, uh, our uh, data analysis is really one that complements um, sort of human um, analysis by recasting a very wide net very quickly. What do we do with this, with these results? First of all, they um, help us um, in the shape of a kind of trend radar, if you like. Um, we can very quickly um, identify connections between emerging trends. One example is what I'm showing you here. Um, we can also um, uh, identify very quickly where um, signals are emerging in ways that we couldn't for the sheer amount um, uh, of data that's being analyzed um, if we did it only with humans. But also these results are used in the construction um, of scenarios for the future. We're at present working on those. And in June, we're going to publish a set of um, scenarios for um, the future of digitalized work and society in 2040. And I invite you um, also to check out our link in June um, when they are published um, to find them. They will be available um, in English language as well as in German. So finally, um, uh, to conclude, um, what can we then say about uses of big data uh, in labor market intelligence? Um, what I've shown you um, are uh, examples of projects, very often pilot projects, um, where we're trying out to complement existing data. But I think it is important to keep in mind um, that the quality of the data you analyze, of course, is something you have to have a very close look at. Um, your results will only be as good as the data that goes into your analysis. So organizing um, feedbacks and reality checks, especially in labor market questions with companies, with businesses, um, with labor unions, with the people who really work on the shop floor is of paramount importance to maintain a high quality. Secondly, um, big data analysis doesn't exist on its own. It is embedded, of course, in a whole suite of instruments um, that allow to make sense of the labor market. And it coexists with a number of other uh, instruments and methods, such as, for example, labor market statistics. And we need to make sure that when we use unconventional data sources, for example, a job portal or a social network um, for information, that we also try to approximate structurally the findings that we have to the structures of our labor market statistics in order to actually complement them and not build up an, uh, a pool of information that's entirely distinct from them. This is, I think, particularly important um, because we need to uh, make our results policy relevant. And um, that works best um, when we also involve our stakeholders in all our projects. We try to do this um, by activating and including a wide network um, of partners from academia, from businesses, from the labor unions um, into each of our projects um, and try to um, continuously uh, maintain a dialogue on the basis of our results um, with those players in order again um, to maintain the quality of what we do, but also to familiarize them with such new um, data and keep them as close as possible to the people who actually take decisions um, on labor and education policy. So I hope this has been uh, informative for you. Um, I thank you very much um, for your interest uh, in my presentation. I would be delighted uh, if you got in touch. Um, if you have questions, uh, here's my contact. Please don't hesitate um, to get in touch with me with any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you.